Hi chem students. When we talk about a chemical reaction, we normally are speaking about the bulk reaction, which is really just a representation of where we start and where we end. Uh, we'd really like to know what's going on piece by piece, step by step, collision by collision, bond breaking and bond making by bond breaking and bond making if we can. So to do this, we represent the bulk reaction, this overall beginning and ending, with a mechanism. And the mechanism is simply a bunch of steps, uh, elementary reactions that is, that should and have to, as a matter of fact, add up to the overall reaction. Let's see what I mean by the mechanism must add up. If this is our bulk reaction, then uh, any mechanism we have better add up to that in the sense that it should represent just these species if we look at the beginning the initial amounts on the, pro on the reactant side and the final amounts on the product side. So let's take a look at this first example right here, right here, let's take a look at that one. And notice that the first step has the NO2 and the F2 reacting to form two species, and then one of those species from the first reaction, from the first step, is going to be used in the second step. In other words, it's created then used, so we can cancel that out. And in doing this, we can see that our reaction becomes 2NO2 plus an F2 goes to the NO2F, but there's two of them. So we can just add that up and see what we get. And notice that matches our bulk reaction, so this is an acceptable mechanism for this bulk reaction. And, and it's not completely validated yet, it's just an acceptable, it's, it's a start. We now need to do more to find out whether this is the best representation of that reaction. And the reason is because we we can also see something like this happen. Here's another reaction. Uh, F2 breaks apart first and then those fluorides interact with the NO2s. Uh, once again we see that these fluorine atoms are created in the first step, used in the second step, so they are not part of the overall reaction when we add it up. We get once again 2NO2 plus an F2 goes to 2NO2F. So both of these, both of these reactions, or these, these mechanisms, I'm sorry, both of them represent the bulk reaction in the sense that they add to it. To find out which one is the better, we have to go and do more, which we'll, which we'll figure out in class. So the question might become, what do we call these two things, these, and both, the fluorine atoms in both of these uh, examples? And they're called intermediates intermediates. What that really means is these are substances that are made in one step and then used up in a later step. It's important that you realize the later step can be the next step, it could be five steps later, it could be a hundred steps later depending on how complex the mechanism is. So we're going to look at this uh, as intermediates, as things that are made in an early step and later on used up. Let's see a large example of this with the real type of molecules all written out. This is organically uh, done like you'd see in an organic class. But if you look carefully, here is a species, a cation, that is created in the first step but then used up immediately in the second step. So it would be an intermediate. We also see in the second step a species made that is once again used up in the later step. So that was also an intermediate. But we should also take notice of the bromide ion. It's created in the first step and then later on used up. It is also an intermediate. So it doesn't have to be in a consecutive steps. It can be in a whole um, anywhere within that mechanism. All right, so that's one of the types of species we can see whenever we have a reaction. So, so far, if we have a, any kind of reaction, we can have a reactant, we can have a product, an intermediate, and in class we talked about one other type, which is a catalyst. But we didn't describe what a catalyst is. So let's get an idea for what a catalyst is. This is something that's, that we, we put in. 
And that's important because that means it can be part of any of our rate laws. If we control the concentration of something, or if we can see it at the beginning or the ending, we can, we can talk about it in terms of being part of the rate law. So if we put this stuff in, that means that it will get used early in a mechanism and then recreated later. So that's what a catalyst is. So an intermediate is something that is, if you think about it, created early and used later. A catalyst would be used early and recreated later. Let's see a couple examples that might uh, clear this up. So here are three particular mechanisms, uh, not for necessarily the same reaction, just three generic reaction mechanisms. And if we look at each one of these, we should be able to, if we're, uh, if we're wise, uh, add these up and see what the bulk reaction is. So I'm going to add up the first one, and according to this, these Y's will cancel out. And this A will cancel out with one of the two A's. So this is, an, this is two different A's, and only one is regenerated. So I can cross out the two. So the bulk reaction is A plus 2B goes to X plus R. And what we see are these are, these are reactants, these are products, and that Y is equal to an intermediate. Hopefully you can see that Y was created in the first step, used in the second step. That makes it an intermediate. Let's try the second mechanism. So in this particular case, we can see that C is an intermediate because it was first created, then used up. We can see that R is an intermediate. But we have something new. We see that in step two, an X is used, and then later on, that same amount of X is recreated. So they cancel out, and they're not part of the balanced reaction. They're not a reactant or a product. And X is definitely not an intermediate because it's first used, then created. So that must mean that X in this particular reaction, or this me particular mechanism, is a catalyst. So if we add this reaction up, we get A plus 2B produces our product P. And here we have reactants, we have our product, we also have intermediates, two different intermediates, C and R, and our catalysts would be X. So hopefully now you see that we could look at the third mechanism and immediately see that B is an intermediate. But the challenge is what do we do with M? What is happening there? Well, obviously it's being used and then recreated, right in the same step. That may seem silly, but sometimes this is some, uh, something that's necessary in a mechanism. So M is a catalyst in this case, and B is an intermediate. And the overall reaction for this is A plus C goes to 2P. Fantastic. So, one last thing to know about these element, uh, about these mechanisms that will help you solve problems is that because an elementary step, uh, because elementary steps represent the actual collisions that are happening, that means that there's stoichiometries telling you the relative ratios of the concentrations that are needed for the reaction to occur. And the immediate implication is, is that the stoichiometric coefficient of a reactant in an elementary reaction that it is the order of that species, the order of reaction. For example, take a look at this first reaction. It's an elementary reaction and it's some part of this, it's, it's K1, so it's part of the first step. That K1 means it's the first step of the, mechan of the mechanism and so this is the rate constant of the first step. N2O5 breaks apart into NO2 plus NO3 and we see what the rate law is. We can write it immediately. The stoichiometric coefficient for a reactant is a 1. So you can just write that down as rate is equal to K1 times N2O5 to the first power. That's right. This right here becomes the power, the order for this. 
This is a unimolecular reaction because there's a single solitary species involved. We go to the next reaction. We notice that it's 2HG plus. This must be happening in step 3 because it says it's K3. Well, the key thing is, is that we're going to keep track of these, so we need to know which K we're using. And we can, since this, since this is elementary, we can immediately write rate is equal to K3 times HG plus that ion squared. So the 2 right here has become the power, the order of this rate law. And you can see these are both a 1 and a 1 in the next example. And that's what we get. We get a first order and a first order. So these little tricks that we've just learned will help us finish up what we need to understand to validate a mechanism. So we've, we've learned how to add them up so that they, we can check to see if they match what the overall reaction is. We've learned how to write the rate law for a, an, an elementary reaction. And we also know how to identify things that are catalysts and intermediates. And that's what we need to be able to do when we're doing our chemical kinetics problems.